Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Uh, Dominique, thank you for the invitation. And to all the team, I'm really impressed that you've put together such a fantastic event. Congratulations. And I hope this is the start of many more to come. So I realize I'm standing between you and lunch, which is always a difficult position to be presenting in. Um, so I'm gonna try and run through this relatively quickly, but I'm also gonna try and engage you as much as I can. So you can't fall asleep in the next half hour as I run through things. Quality and safety in surgery is the topic that I'm going to be talking about. Why am I here talking about this and who am I? Thank you very much for the fantastic introduction. My background's in general surgery. I took a, a fellowship with the Lifebox organisation, which is really what's got me to this point here today. Um, I spent quite a lot of time working in low-income countries and seeing firsthand some of the difficulties and problems that people were facing in surgery, but also, very importantly, within the wider healthcare system. And that's led me into my current role right now. I'm spending two years working for the global chairman of healthcare at KPMG, which has given me a really interesting bird's eye view perspective on healthcare systems around the world. And I'll bring a little bit of that knowledge in as I run through this. The other important point, um, I f helped co-found Global Surge a few years ago, but I know Francesco is talking to you about that tomorrow. So I have a few slides that are relevant to healthcare quality and safety, but I won't be going into that in much more detail. I'm very happy to speak to anyone um, who has any questions. So why healthcare quality and safety? This chap, Peter Provenost from the US, from Massachusetts, is one of my heroes. He's an intensivist. Um, and he sums up with this quote on this slide an awful lot of what I believe about healthcare in its totality, not just surgery, but looking right across the spectrum of how we deliver healthcare to our patients today. And as medics, as doctors, as clinicians, we are trained and we obsess over understanding the disease that we treat. We obsess over the therapeutics to improve that disease, but very, very, very few of us focus in on how that is delivered. And that's what uh, Peter talks about as being the, the third bucket here, which is ignored by research funders, government and academia. The delivery of healthcare is viewed as being part of the art of medicine, and it really isn't. There is a science to it, and we can learn a lot from other sectors, other industries at looking at how we deliver care. And I'll challenge you on that as we go through this because it's really important for your future, over your career, how healthcare will be delivered is going to be very different in low income settings and high income settings right around the world. So I think before I go down into the detail of that, a question for you, my first question for you is, I'm talking about high quality healthcare, but what does quality in healthcare mean? Is anyone brave enough to, to have a stab at what quality in healthcare actually is? How would you define it? Any ideas? Naomi. Yeah, uh, I think pretty spot on. And the bit I'd add to that, which is the bit that the um, US Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality have in their definition is what, what connects that. It's the service you provide to get to that point. So how does the service you provide link to those outcomes that Naomi mentions, be that um, health outcomes, wh whatever you define those as, uh, typically in terms of clinical outcomes, but may well be patient experiences of care as well. So keep that in mind as we go through this. How does the service connect with the outcomes that you see? So another question, what are the different domains of high quality healthcare? It's a big topic, we've just given a bit of a definition, but what are the different facets, if you break it down, of what high quality healthcare can be? And I'll give you a clue to start with, one of them is the other point in the title of this talk. Yeah. So education is a common thread that runs through all of these. So it's not pulled out as an individual domain, but education plays a part in every single facet of high quality healthcare. So safety is one. I'll give you that because that's part of the part of the talk. Any other ideas? What makes high quality healthcare? Yep. Time. Time absolutely. A really important part of the uh, Lancet Global Commission was looking at the delay to treatment. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, so it's current, it's evidence-based, it's, it's, um, there is a science to the healthcare we provide, absolutely. Any other points? Affordability. 
Affordability is a really strong one and particularly relevant to the highest of high income countries in the US, but also the lowest of low income countries. So not just focused on um, low income care. Any, any other points? Accessibility, spot on. You have to be able to get to reach healthcare in order to be able to receive it. Resources. Sorry? Resources. Yes, research. So research informs, again, that's a common thread that runs through all of these. Any other points that anyone wants to offer before I do the big reveal? Yes, go on. Affordability. Yeah, absolutely. And as we mentioned, that is just as relevant in high income countries that have to pay as it is in low. So here we go. This is the official list as determined by the Institute of Healthcare Improvements. This is pretty much the gold standard for what healthcare quality is measured against. Safety we mentioned, effective, that's the point about research and science to ensure that our, what we're actually doing is evidence-based. Patient-centred, we mentioned already the need uh, to ensure patient satisfaction, how much does our care actually deliver what the patient wants ultimately. Timely we mentioned, efficient is really important and people do get scared of efficiency because they think it's about cost cutting um, and it's really not, it's as much about wasted time both for and other wasted aspects, but not just for the patient, also for the provider and also for the health system at large. And as I put here, that could be about wasted energy and ideas as much as anything else. And then equitable, um, we touched on that with the mentioning access, but it's also about other points as well. It's similar in the UK, if you look at health outcomes based on socioeconomic status, we know that even in England, um, high quality healthcare isn't truly being delivered. So those are a few of the points. Now, uh, importantly, um, five out of these six, I'm certainly often going to know off, uh, not going to be able to offer much expertise on. Each one is a book in itself and a, and a lecture in itself. So I'm going to focus in on safety. And we'll talk a, a little bit about the wider picture before I drill down on surgery. It's important to give you some context. So what does it mean for the person for the patient or for the care deliverer for the healthcare system. I use this picture a lot because this was a really instrumental moment in my learning about global surgery and health systems and this was when I was working with uh, Lifebox Foundation and, and Mercy Ships in Madagascar a few years ago. Um, this was a rural hospital in Madagascar. Um, this is their one operating theatre in that hospital. Hospital served a regional population of about a quarter of a million people. Um, this is the, uh, the surgeon uh, the anaesthetist, physician anaesthetist, um, the clinical director in the background and the theatre nurse on the left. And I, they, they, you know, they were expecting our visit and we were ostensibly there to talk about Lifebox and actually anaesthesia training and pulse oximetry. But they really wanted to show us their situation, what actual their office looked like for delivering surgical and anaesthetic care. And it really struck, with, struck me massively actually that's um, really determined a lot of what I've done since. It looks like uh, an everyday operating theatre, you could imagine perhaps walking in there and providing surgical services, but it's only when you start to pick it apart you realise how this hospital cannot deliver high quality and safe care. Why is that? Let me pick a few things out. Well, first of all, this is the one working operating theatre in the one hospital that serves nearly a quarter of a million people. So, is there a problem with access? Absolutely. Is there a problem with equity? Absolutely. They have to pay in order to um, access a lot of what is delivered in the hospital, um, antibiotics for example. The, the hospital actually has a really good service because they will accept payment in kind, so talking to the staff here, if the patients can't afford the antibiotics, they would accept a family member coming and doing some work in the hospital grounds, perhaps some maintenance, some gardening, um, in order to be able to provide that. So affordability is a major problem. Um, They've only got one theatre, so have they got the capacity to provide care? Absolutely not. And we were there really to look at safety. And I can pick a few points out that illustrate the lack of safety here. And one thing is they've got an oxygen bottle, which is great, because most of these settings um, don't actually have supplementary oxygen to give to patients. But you can see the bandage tying it onto the tube. Um, that oxygen bottle has never actually had a proper connector to the, uh, to the face mask. Um, it, so it's pretty questionable as to how much oxygen is actually delivered to the patient in any case. That face mask, they only have two in the hospital. Um, they've been there as long as the anaesthetic machine. The other one perished. 
Uh, that one is on its absolute last legs and is never really taken out of service for sterilization and cleaning, as is the kit that it's connected to. Bottom right, there's a suction machine. Um, what you can't see behind it is all the electric wires hanging out. If they turn that on, it usually trips off the electricity to everything else, which you wouldn't consider to be safe care. Um, they had a donated ECG machine just behind the surgeon's, um, his right hand shoulder there. It was donated, so there wasn't any thought to supply chain, so there wasn't any thought to replacing the ECG stickers. So really most patients never have any real cardiovascular monitoring during surgery. And then I'll come back to this again at the end. On the operating theatre table you can see their instrument trays. Those are the only instrument trays they've got and I'll show you what the inside of one of those looks like shortly. But believe me, when you've seen the inside of those, they certainly don't offer safe care. And what you can't see is the sterilization room behind. Um, the, st the autoclave broke some time ago. They've never had a um, biomedical engineer to fix it. So the instruments are simply dipped in something that's a very questionable sterilizing solution. And it's not really clear what that was. So the instruments really aren't sterile at all. That's an awful lot to take in from one picture. And I said to the surgeon, look, you know, if there's, if there's one thing I could do to help make all of this better, what would it be? And his response has always stayed with me. He said, how can I tell you one thing when everything here is failing and broken? And that's the sort of situation that high quality and safe healthcare is not being provided in, in these settings. And what's really remarkable is the workforce that stay and try to do the best for their patients that they can. And that's why this is a very important topic um, so I thought about doing a bit of um, who wants to be a millionaire with some questions at this point, but I don't have sufficient research funds to do that, I'm afraid. So three questions to ask you to put all of that in context in the wider world. For low-income countries, for low-middle-income countries, thinking about adverse safety events, what proportion of patients do you think suffer an adverse event? So put your hand up if you think one in a thousand patients suffer an adverse safety event. One in a hundred, a few, one in ten, one in five. Okay, anyone think less, lower than one in five? Okay, that's good. I'll tell you the answer in a minute. Who thinks all of those adverse events were potentially preventable? Who thinks maybe half? Who thinks very few were preventable? None. Okay, about half, right. And who thinks one in 10 of those events were associated with the death of the patient? Who thinks half? Who thinks less than half? Okay, less sure on that one. Okay, well, let me, let me give you the real figures. The first thing to say is a massive paucity around research in this area and the second health warning with this paper, there should be a health warning with this paper for patients in these settings, but a health warning for readers as well, is the, this varies massively depending on definitions used. But the definitive paper looking at patient safety in low-income settings suggested that on average just under 1 in 10 patients were um, suffering an adverse event. However, mostly middle-income countries and a retrospective review of notes the lowest income of the highest rate was nearly one in five patients. And in reality, that is a massive underestimate of the lowest low income settings where there aren't even patient records to review. So I would say considerably higher than one in five patients in the lowest low income settings are suffering an adverse event. 80% of those were judged preventable. That's, a, that's incredible. And you think about the impact of that on patients, but you also think about the impact of that on the costs within a healthcare system. Nearly a third of those adverse events led to the death of the patient. And that's really important because these errors are happening in systems which are far less able to A, detect the error, error and B, recover the patient from that error when it's occurred. And you might think that in these settings the patients are much more sick, these were complicated scenarios. They largely weren't. A third of these with straightforward therapeutic errors occurring in non-complex situations. So really, really significant problem. And as I said, therapeutic errors, the biggest cause, diagnostic and operative. So from a surgical point, surgery operative error is within the top three um, occurring. Now, if I was to ask you another question and say, what do you think the causes of these errors are if you drill down? Put your hand up if you think this is down to a shortage of workforce in these settings. 
Not enough healthcare staff in low and middle income countries. A few hands up. Who thinks it's down to a shortage of equipment or unavailability of equipment because it's broken and not repaired? A few. Who thinks it's down to a lack of training? A few more. Who thinks it's down to a lack of guidelines or protocols? A few. OK. Well, it, this might not be what you expect on the basis of that show of hands. When you actually drill down into what the causes of error are in these settings, it's overwhelmingly inadequate training and supervision and a lack of policy or failure to implement the policy if there is a policy or guideline in place. Inadequate staffing is actually at the bottom of this list because if you don't have the staff to make a therapeutic error, then you're not going to have the error. And also equipment, despite what you might think and despite what a lot of my work is around, equipment is actually also one of the lesser identifiable errors. So if you're thinking about what you're going to do to change this, it has to come down to development of protocol and treatment guidelines of telling people what best practice is and ensuring that it's implemented and that people follow it. It's about education, it's about communication. Now, at this point, I like to put this slide up from the UK because it's very easy to stand here and preach as someone who's been a doctor working in high income settings that everything's fine and rosy at home, and it really isn't. Um, in the UK, we measure never events. Never events are safety inc incidents which should never happen. They should be 100% preventable. And you can see, OK, 4.6 million operations per year in the UK is a, is a lot of surgery. But even so, we are still regularly suffering incidents, patient safety incidents, that should never occur in surgery. Imagine having 83 planes take off and fly to the wrong di um, destination, 42 trains arriving at the wrong platform, or 130 bags left behind. Actually, that's probably a bad analogy because there's a lot more than 130 bags left behind. But you get the impression that this, these things simply shouldn't happen, and yet they still do regularly in healthcare. To put that in an aesthetic context, I know um, Nick has spoken a little bit about this already, but there's a wider point to be made here about quality healthcare and access. They go hand in hand because you can put in healthcare in place. You can introduce universal health coverage. You can have low income countries delivering healthcare. But if your risk of dying from anaesthetic is as high as it is in Toga and Benin, would you ever undergo that surgery? If your risk of an, a preventable adverse event, eight, so 80% of adverse events are preventable, if you know that, would you even go to access healthcare in those settings? So a really, really important point, wider point around um, quality and safety is if it's absent, people won't access the healthcare in the first place. And so we go back to the definition about service that you provide leading to a benefit in the outcomes that you want. You will not connect the two if you don't have um, safe and high quality healthcare because people will not go and access that service. And I know Nick's been talked about this already, so I'll skip over that. So anaesthesia, high level, let's drill down on surgery now. Put your hand up if you've heard of Global Surge or participated in Global Surge. A few people, goodness me, this time next year I want that to be 100%. The important point about Global Surge Collaborative is we set out to measure a lot of outcomes in surgery. And the overarching take-home point here is you can't manage what you don't measure. If you don't know what outcomes are, how can you put in place interventions to correct them and improve them. If you don't know how bad outcomes are, how can you lobby governments and ministers of health to improve healthcare in that setting? Global Surges um, started out looking at um, bellwether procedure of laparotomy. Global Surge 1 actually looked at worldwide mortality outcomes and a number of other outcomes associated with that. And it's the first global study to do so, to provide globally comparative figures. And if we're talking about quality and also the impact of safety within this, Global Surge was really unique in showing that if you standardise for lots of patient measures, if you standardise for severity of surgery, for operation, for the sickness of the patient, even controlling for all of those factors, 24-hour mortality was three times higher, 30-day mortality almost double in low-income settings compared with high. Now, that's an underestimate of the true severity of the picture because we know that in the low-income settings, we still got only some of the better hospitals participating. 
but the inequity between those is huge and never really previously been reported on this scale. And we showed that checklist use was significantly associated, if you control for all those other factors, checklist, surgical safety checklist use was significantly associated with mortality. It's interesting if you drill down into some of the factors as to why this might be the case, because numbers on a page don't really tell you what's going on on the shop floor in these settings. I'll pick out a few to indicate between high and low income. So for example, if you look at procedure start time, nighttime surgery was only just under 20% of surgery in high income settings, um, nearly a third of operating in low income settings. So quite a big spread. Questions about capacity, about supervision, why isn't emergency work being able to be done during the day? If you look at senior surgeon operating, 97% of emergency laparotomy cases in a high income setting had a senior surgeon present, only 70% in low income settings, similar for an anaesthesia. So lots of different factors contributing towards these outcomes that we've observed. And this starts to hint at some of the interventions we might be able to put in place in future to address this. The situation was even worse for paediatric cases, over seven times higher um, mortality for paediatric surgery in low-income uh, countries. And on my recent study just published earlier this year, drilling down on surgical site infections from Global Surge 2, you can see significantly higher levels, 23% versus 9% of surgical site infection. And you think about what that means for the patient, for the costs, for the healthcare system, and for actually the wider economy and family for the patient that have to care for that, um, they have to spend money on the antibiotics, they're out of work, they're not able to earn for their family. So why is patient safety so hard in these countries? If this is an area you want to read about, Mary Dixon Woods in Cambridge, the RAND professor, is one of the key people to look up. She's published lots on this, really interesting work. And this is an interesting paper that looks at the difference between proximal obstacles and distal factors. And that's a little bit what we started to do with some of those issues around global surge one and emergency laparotomy. You can talk about shortage of skilled nursing staff being a patient safety issue. But if you look at the wider picture, the distal factors, well, there's human resource shortages nationally. There are a few opportunities to um, train, update skills. There's very little in the way of management around healthcare workforce in these settings. Um, there's a high turnover of staff. We're poaching them to high income countries. So actually, what sounds like a simple problem, oh, there's a shortage of skilled workers. Actually, there's myriad factors that contribute that all of those need addressing. And obviously, we are very obsessed with numbers. We're very interested with statistics. But if you really want to get down into why those problems are there, you need to start undertaking some qualitative work. And these are some interviews that were undertaken with staff thinking about the material factors, physical environment, equipment and supplies that affected patient safety. And you can see comments here about when all the operating rooms are occupied by elective patients, like that one operating theatre in Madagascar, and an emergency case comes in, well, what do you do? You haven't got anywhere to do surgery on them. And so they don't receive surgery, or they have a delay, or they're left until midnight hours when there's a, only a resident to provide the surgery, etc., etc. So it's only really when you drill down into some of this qualitative information that you truly understand the issues around quality and safety in these settings. This is not to say that healthcare workers in these settings are not aware of these problems. They absolutely are. They see errors occurring frequently. There's perhaps a dichotomy because in high income settings, we have all of the guidelines and protocols you need to deliver health and safe care. The issue is getting us to actually do it. In these low income settings, they have an awareness of all of these problems much more than we do because they see them so much more frequently, but what they don't have is the guidelines or the protocols or knowledge of best practice to actually be able to affect change and deliver it. And there are other issues as well that you only really get into when you start to talk to people and try and understand what actually influences the delivery of healthcare in foreign settings that we ourselves might not be familiar with in our comfortable home setting. And in some places, this is, this is a real issue of understanding what the cause of problems are and getting people to work with them to address it. In that when a patient dies, if it's God's time, then it's not the error that's necessarily caused it or the practitioner um, who's caused that. So what are the solutions? Well, there's a common word here, which is investment. Um, 
but it's about improving the quality of care, the surgical care. It's about investing in the training and workforce of those who deliver it. It's about investing in the technology and the infrastructure. But it's also about actually looking at what we do. And a point, Naomi, that you mentioned at the start was really important. This isn't necessarily about asking people to do things that can't be done. If we could just lift hospitals and individual practitioners up to the best level of best practice that's being delivered in a hospital down the road or in a neighbouring city that's comparable to their setting and their supplies and their funding, we could still improve healthcare massively around the world. And that's just as applicable here as it is in London, as it is in New York, as it is in low-income settings. One big aspect of my work has been around the surgical safety checklist. Put your hand up if you're familiar with the surgical safety checklist. Almost everyone, fantastic. This has been a lot of my work over the years going into safe, uh, safe surgery through Lifebox and implementation of this. For those who didn't put their hand up, I hope you're at least familiar with the results. It sounds almost too good to be true that a piece of paper and a checklist can reduce mortality by nearly half and by complications a third. And if this was a pill, people all around the world would be clamoring to have this with their surgery, but it's not quite as simple as that. A lot of my work has been around implementation, as I say, and you can see here from a, a low-income setting in Moldova, um, on the left, some of the markers about aspects of safe surgical care, the processes around that, sponge counting, site confirmation, antibiotic prophylaxis, all below 30% pre-checklist implementation, all rising dramatically in the months that followed. But the key point is that's four months that followed, and even at four months, they're still not getting it all right. And the point here is that change takes time. This is another paper looking, following over a much longer period, right from implementation in 2009 to third quarter of 2010. And you can see even over that time period, adherence to surgical safety is still increasing because what lies at the root of this is changing what people do. And Lucien Leap described this very well in editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, a couple of years ago on a paper that questioned some of the outcomes, uh, the benefit from the surgical safety checklist. And this goes to the heart of it. It's not about ticking a box. It's about performing the actions that it calls for. And in performing the actions as it calls for, as with all aspects of improving uh, safety and quality of healthcare, it requires someone to change their behavior, to change what they do. And that's quite difficult. And what are the drivers of doing that? Well, really, this goes back to what I said about this being very well known in other areas, much more so than it is in medicine, and known for a long time. Human behavior flows from desire, emotion, and knowledge. And if you're gonna change healthcare delivery, quality and safety, you need to go back and remember that and give people the desire to change, to make them feel the need for change, and give them the knowledge to help them change. How do we do that with Lifebox? This was back in Madagascar. We give people ownership of healthcare and we give them ownership of the intervention. They design it, they shape it, they make it locally relevant. We practice it, we role play it. Um, this was going through surgical safety checklist with an anesthesia and surgeon and the scrub nurse kindly volunteering to be the patient in one of the wards. And this was then transferring that to the operating theatre to make sure that it actually was real in their practice and not just something that they role played in a in a clinic room but when you delve down into some of those points you need to supply the knowledge so there's no use in getting people to make sure they've counted swab sharps and instruments if they've never counted swab sharps and instruments ever before and this was one of my colleagues a theatre nurse teaching the local theatre nurses how to count swab sharps and instruments and this was the checklist that we ended up with. Looks very different to the WHO when I showed you a few slides ago, but this is their checklist, their wording. It fits with their flow, and it's their items that they chose to go on this to adapt and keep from the WHO checklist. And when you do that, when it becomes theirs and they take ownership of it, they feel that they can change their behaviours because this fits, this is what they dictated and this is what they determined. So final question. Put your hand up if you've heard of Lifebox before. A few people, I hope again, by this time uh, tomorrow, everybody has heard of it. And I know Marco's got a stand outside and I haven't actually met Marco, but I'm looking forward to doing so. Um, Lifebox is a, is a surgical safety charity, a global NGO that promotes safer perioperative surgical practice. Um, 
it specifically works in low and mid-income settings and it's probably most famous for the pulse oximeter, an example of which is out on, on Marco's stand. Um, founded back in 2011, but has actually had really amazing success since then. Distributed nearly 15,000 pulse oximeters now in over 100 countries. And reason being, this is on the surgical safety checklist, but no manufacturer made a really robust, affordable pulse oximeter for low-income settings, and so that's how Lifebox started out, and now works on quite a lot of other areas, including surgical site infection and checklist implementation. This is some of the global impact and the global places that we've been working, and you can find out more on the stand. But this goes back to those instrument boxes on Madagas in Madagascar. When they flicked open one of those surgical instrument trays and showed me what they were working with, this is what I found inside. These are a jumble of instruments, some of which are rusting, some of which are 30 years old. The surgeon actually brings his own in from home, so doesn't use these so much. But nobody takes care of them, nobody looks after them, and they have no way of getting new ones. There's no procurement, and the health ministry certainly doesn't have enough um, funding to be able to afford to do that. And it got me thinking about what you do in these settings and how you interact with people and get them to change their behaviours but help them to do so. One of the biggest wins from the pulse oximeter for Lifebox is not so much the pulse oximeter, that's important, but it's the conversation that you have with the anaesthetist when they've got the pulse oximeter. It's how you open that conversation and start to teach and train them about delivering better anaesthesia. And my question was, well, could we do the same with surgical instruments? Could we devise um, a, a cheap, affordable surgical instrument tray that could open a conversation with surgeons for how we teach and train them about surgical site infection and some wider issues around delivering safe surgery. And so that's the project that I've been working on now. Some of you may have even answered the questionnaire we were circulating back at Christmas around this, and thank you for support. This is what we found out in the field with the work that we've been undertaking. The problem is real. In Ethiopia, uh, it's largely cheap Chinese surgical equipment that lasts six months at most and then isn't replaced. You can see here at some of the local hostels we visited, as they serve huge populations, they don't have surgeons, they have surgical health officers. They're primarily performing C-section and emergency surgery, but you can see here the number of surgical instrument sets that they actually have to deliver that. I think we probably haven't got time to show you the video now, but I'm happy to show it during lunch for anyone who's interested. But I'm going to finish with three reflections on all of this for you to think about while you're having your sandwiches in the next hour and hopefully as you go forward with your global surgery work over the weeks and months ahead. Three important take-home messages that I want you to think about. I started this presentation by giving you the big picture in terms of healthcare quality and safety. And many of you will get involved in projects that are perhaps like the surgical instrument tray are delivering very specific interventions in these settings. And I think that's all fine and good but don't do that without having knowledge of what the big picture is first. You might leap in on something like surgical instruments, but if you don't know that the bigger picture is really the guidelines and protocols about how those are sterilised, how those are procured, how those are repaired, how those are replaced, then you're missing how the actual, what the benefit is that it needs to be. So start big, always be aware of the big picture before you zone in on what you want to do. Bear in mind that whatever you do want to do is a long-term endeavour. It will take all of us our entire careers to lift the capability and capacity in some of the settings that we work in. And you have to enter into this with that firmly in your mind and be committed to that. And finally, if you are looking for an area to get involved in in terms of global surgery, global health, then I would certainly commend safety as a, as a really interesting and important and valid area um, to you for this. And the important point is that it's a universal intervention. It doesn't matter what aspect of healthcare delivery or therapeutics or intervention, there is always room to improve the safety and the care that we do, be that surgery or anything else. And I should add, it's just as an important an endeavour back home with the same skills and the same knowledge and many of the similar interventions. Thank you very much.